Welcome back to our video series on evolution. In part one, we introduced the idea of evolution and looked at some evidence to support it. Here in part two, we're going to look at a process for change, specifically natural selection. But before we do that, we need to do a little bit more history lesson, aka the evolution of evolution. Some of the early influences on evolutionary thought came from geology. In the 1790s, James Hutton espoused the theory of gradualism, the idea that the earth we see today was shaped by slow-moving processes that continue today and have been at work for extremely long periods of time. Take for instance the ideas about continental drift. This was controversial because it required the ideas of creation proposed uh, in biblical texts to be reconsidered. At least the time frames need to be looked at with some skepticism as the geological processes that form sh uh, shape formations such as the Grand Canyon uh, suggest a much longer history. In the 1830s, Charles Lyell, who became a close and influential friend of Charles Darwin, published The Principles of Geology, a multi-volume text that was considered to be the most complete and definitive literature on the topic at this time. The main thing we get from the study of geology is this idea of a slow gradual change, and it apply, as it applies to the um, shaping of the, the physical features on Earth, that same concept could maybe be applied to the changes that we see in living things. While Darwin was influenced by his studies on geology, he was also influenced by the work of Thomas Malthus. Malthus was a clergyman who was known for his ideas on economics and populations. He suggested that all populations eventually outgrow their resources, and therefore competition for limited resources would increase. Darwin would one day co-opt this idea into his ideas on natural selection. But Darwin wasn't the only one, or nor was he the first to champion the ideas of evolution. In 1809, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck published his hypothesis on evolution via the transfer of acquired characteristics. Let's take a closer look at the work of Lamarck. Lamarck proposed that species could change. He believed that all organisms had the ability to become more complex in structure in response to their environment. In other words, by use or disuse. Then they could pass that change on to their offspring. For example, Lamarck proposed that some short-necked ancestors to giraffes in response to needing to get to higher leaves uh, in the trees could stretch their necks and then could stretch their necks some more and then could stretch their necks some more. So through the need to have a longer neck that they could develop it over time and then they'd pass that uh, change on to their offspring. Let's try a different example. Uh, here's a bird's feet and let's say that this bird's feet look like this and then this bird spends a lot of time in and around water maybe even swimming around Lamarck's, under Lamarck's idea uh, this bird would eventually or could eventually develop the webbed feet now I know that this bird over here and this bird over here are different types of birds but bear with me I'm trying to make a point here now uh, if they pass that webbed feet onto their offspring, then, then we'd have change in species um, passed along by the inheritance of acquired characteristics. And it sounds kind of logical uh, until we put it into this perspective. Imagine that uh, your arms look like this. and um, Then you get a job as a blacksmith, and all day long you're carrying this heavy hammer around and you're pounding out horseshoes, and after a while, you know, your right arm look like, might look like this. Well, you've acquired that characteristic through use or disuse. Could you pass it on to your offspring? Oh, come on. That's pretty creepy. Uh, of course that couldn't happen. So Lamarck was on the right trail, meaning organisms do change and the environment does play a role, but his mechanism was wrong. We don't just get what we need. We'll see how this works a little bit later, uh, but this brings us to Darwin. Now, Charles Darwin is one of the most influential people in all of biology. He was the son of a wealthy physician, and his father hoped that he would follow him into the, in the medical field, but he was more interested in, in nature and his other studies. In 1831, Darwin set sail on the HMS Beagle, employed as the ship's naturalist. What started out to be a two-year trip to map the coast of South America ended up lasting five years, and all along the way, Darwin would, was documenting all the natural life he saw, gathering specimens, drawing pictures, and making observations. And he was particularly taken by some of the observations he made in the Galapagos Islands off the west coast of uh, South America. And here he found some uh, diverse species that didn't seem to exist anywhere else in the world, that seemed very isolated and uniquely uh, suited for this uh, very uh, diverse environment. So he drew pictures and collected specimens and kept 
very detailed records and this uh, the amount of information he collected during this trip lasted him years he spent years and years kind of pouring over his observations and his um, his drawings and writings uh, and these ideas helped him develop the ideas of natural selection as a mechanism for evolution What's interesting was he didn't publish these ideas for a very long period of time. He was busy working on lots of other things. He was also very hesitant to publish his ideas for fear of how it might be received by both the scientific community and the religious community. Let's talk about some of the observations that Darwin made and some of the things that he knew. So along the way, Charles Darwin noted there's, there's a lot of stuff out here. When you grow up in a small part of the world and then you start to travel across the world, you realize that there's a lot more out there than you thought. And this biodiversity intrigued him. And also, the distribution of species wasn't random. Species were distributed in areas where they seemed to really suit and fit their environment. Second, uh, another observation he made was that within populations there are variations. Not everyone in the, in the population uh, is the same. And these variations were uh, pretty important. And then the observation that more individuals are born than survive. Now let's take those observations into account with what Darwin also knew. Darwin had studied geology. He understood these ideas about gradual change that Hutton and Lyell proposed. He also had studied um, whoops, jumped in, Lamarck's work, the idea that species could change to suit their environment. So the environment connected with change was something he already kind of was thinking about. But importantly, Darwin also understood artificial selection. You know, that population could change only when selected individuals are allowed to produce, reproduce. Um, agriculture, um, farmers had been able to change the look of their herds and their stock uh, by selecting only certain individuals to breed. You could get big, strong cattle by letting your biggest, strongest bull mate with your biggest, strongest cattle. Um, these are ideas that people understood, that they could change the look of a population by selecting who breeds and who doesn't. And finally, Darwin knew about Malthus's essay on populations that limited resources leads to competition. Now you may already know um, kind of a general definition of natural selection or maybe even a detailed understanding of natural selection but based on this information on this page pause the video and see if you ex can extrapolate from these observations and this knowledge how Darwin would construct his ideas about natural selection uh, driving evolution. Now like I said Darwin sat on these ideas for a really long period of time. He became fairly famous in the um, scientific community working on other things, but in the background he was developing these ideas. And in 1844, he did uh, write a, a short essay called Descent with Modification and based on four tenets. Uh, one, organisms differ from each other in ways that are inherited. Two, more are born than can survive meaning there's a struggle for existence. There is competition. So not everyone's the same, and we have to struggle to survive. Three, certain inherited variants increase the chances of their carriers surviving and reproducing, meaning because you're different, you might have a better uh, ability to compete. And finally, selection leads to the accumulation of favored variants, which over long periods of time produce new life forms, the origin of species, meaning that as certain variations uh, survive and reproduce in greater quantities, those variations become um, more prevalent in the populations, causing populations to change over time. We can kind of condense and summarize natural selection. When organisms and populations have to compete, and there are variations within the population, then the natural conditions will favor some variations over others. Individuals with these variations will survive and reproduce in greater numbers. Over successive generations, the population will change to look more and more like that variation. Darwin described animals as having fitness, or species as having fitness, not just animals, of course, but the relative ability to survive and reproduce, so you are fit if you have variations that will help you survive and reproduce so that you could pass those traits along. Sometimes we call this survival of the fittest. Now again, Darwin wasn't real excited about getting this idea out there. He was very hesitant to kind of bring a lot of attention to it. But then something interesting happened. In 1858, a young and up-and-coming naturalist named Alfred Wallace, who respected Darwin greatly, uh, developed an idea and sent his thesis to Darwin for feedback. And when Darwin w read it, wow, was he surprised, because Alfred Wallace, on his own, had come up with 
natural selection. Well, this was problematic for Darwin because now, if he published, it would look like he's stealing the work of this young guy. But if he didn't publish, then Alfred Wallace is going to kind of beat him to the punch after Darwin has sat on this idea for, you know, nearly 20 years. So, in the end, they co-authored a paper to present the process of evolution through natural selection. And then a short while after, Darwin finally publishes his very famous book on the origin of species by means of natural selection. The book was met with much fanfare and also, of course, some controversy at the time. But to really get our head around natural selection, we kind of need to look at a few examples. For example, if we were to think about how Darwin would explain giraffes versus how Lamarck would explain it, it wouldn't be that a giraffe developed a long neck over time. It would be that there was some giraffe-like animal whose neck was, you know, maybe here, and, uh, and there was competition for limited leaves, and because of that, if you happen to by chance have a longer variation of neck, then you could get to more food, then therefore you survived, and therefore you reproduced. In the next generation, those with slightly the longer necks survived in greater numbers, and over successive generations, we've exaggerated the trait to this extremely long neck. We could say the same thing for the evolution of the speed in a cheetah, that each generation, if only the fastest cheetah are able to catch food, then they survive in greater numbers and pass on those fast genes, and over time the species gets faster and faster. But it's this, over, this uh, repeated selection over many generations that shapes the look of a species. Now, I'm going to end this video here. Um, we're going to have a part two of this section on natural selection because we have to put natural selection into action. So check back uh, for part two, part two, part two, part B of part two, I should say, um, where we're going to put natural selection into action and look at our modes of selection. So come back for part two, and I hope you learned something.